going to begin by asking Megan to welcome you and tell us a little bit about the rural advocacy league. Nico, so welcome for or thank you for coming. And a little bit about the rural advocacy league is we are a student-based group at the law school, and basically we want to bring awareness to rural issues in Montana or abroad. That's our main goal. And we always put on the Rural Advocacy Week, or Rural Law Week. And as part of that week, we do a few things. Like uh, well, we have the talk going on this evening. Uh, we'll have also a discussion involving, involving the irrigation uh, legislation. And um, you know, I want to have a minute domain as well. Yeah, so that's our main goal, is just to bring awareness of different issues. And that's the whole point of having panel discussions is to have people come in, speakers who are knowledgeable about different issues and different areas of the law, and just give us a, I guess, a background about it, what they think about the different issues as well. And that's, so that's why we're here today. So thank you guys for coming. And I'm your moderator, Kristen Juris, and as most of you know, I'm a professor here, and my qualifications for this are pretty slim. I grew up on a ranch, <laughs> and I teach agricultural law. And actually, Bruce used to be one of my clients when I practiced in Great Falls. I had a lot of farm and ranch clients. And what I really liked about him, I said this yesterday, he brought his kids along to that annual corporate meetings that we had to talk about the farm affairs and kind of started raising them up to know how to manage and operate a farm. So before we introduce each of the panelists, um, let me just set a little bit of a background because I know not all of you have taken agricultural law and might not be familiar with what's going on. So a little bit of background before each of our main topics. We're talking about the 2012 Farm Bill. Every four to five years, Congress passes a farm bill that will govern for the next four to five years. If they don't pass a farm bill or extend the current farm bill, we revert back to some 1949 Agricultural Act provisions. So uh, it is important that they do it. Here's some statistics. Less than 1% of the current population in the United States um, claim agriculture as their primary occupation. There are about 2.2 million farms throughout the United States. 98% of those farms are family owned. They have family in ownership and in management of the operations. And of these farms, look at 88% are classified as small, gross sales before expenses less than $250,000. Now, who's receiving farm program payments, which is what we're gonna talk about today? Larger farms, sales in excess of 250,000, and our non-family farms, those are only 2% farms, they do produce 84% of our agricultural production, and they get 78% of commodity uh, payments. Small farms account for 16% of the value of our agricultural production. Look at how much they get of CRP payments, their conservation reserve program payments, which we're going to talk about in this program, 62%. Um, and look at this statistic. 61% of farms, that includes ranches, receive no government payments at all, okay? Um, here's again, just to break down, our non-family farms are relatively small, 2%. Look at how many farmers are in retirement. Look at how many farms, the majority, or plurality, um, are just people go want to live on five to 10 acres and they might raise a few chickens. Okay. Agriculture is the number one um, economy in Montana, we uh, produce a lot of wheat. Usually, uh, you guys can correct me on this, a lot of times <laughs> more in cattle and calf sales than wheat, but in this particular year, wheat was our biggest commodity. Look at sugar beets. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the budget. Look at where our federal spending goes. Mostly it's our programs like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Everything else is 19%. And of that, the farm programs only take less than one-fourth of one percent of federal spending. The farm bill, look at how big it is. Look at all of these different titles. I'm not going to go through everyone, but it's everything from our food stamp program to international trade programs to rural development providing loans. Um, so it's quite, uh, not to mention the forestry products as well. 
So the Farm Bill is more than just government payments to farmers. For the 2008 Farm Bill, they projected about a $57 billion a year budget. And look at where most of that goes to our food stamp portion of the Farm Bill. Okay? Only 13% of the USDA's budget went to farm spending. Again, um, here's where most of it goes is food stamps. And tonight we're going to be talking about these sorts of payments, direct or fixed payments, payments that depend on low market prices and on conservation reserves. And I'm going to stop now and we're going to introduce, oops, I didn't want to do that. We're going to introduce the panelists. So let's begin with We've asked Haley Nelson to introduce Bruce Nelson. <laughs> There's no coincidence there. <laughs> my name is Haley Nelson. I'm a first year law student here at the University of Montana. And this is my father, Bruce Nelson. Um, so yes, I was one of those children who went to the meetings with Kristen Juris when I was small. Um, and I continue to attend our annual meetings for our Family Farm Corporation. Um, my dad, Bruce, is administrator of the Farm Service Agency. He's currently serving that position in Washington, D.C. Um, and he was able to come into this position with a lot of experience in government, politics, but most importantly, our own family farm. And he grew up on that farm, which was our my great-grandfather's homestead in Shoto County. Um, we still own that land today, and we're very proud of that, as I'm a fifth-generation Montanan. Um, he attended U of M for undergraduate, so he is an ardent Grizzly fan, as are my brothers and my mother. Um, and on a side note, he was a member of the U of M School of Law class of 1978 for approximately two and a half days. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't let him forget, obviously. <laughs> Um, after working in politics in the 1970s, he worked full-time on our farm um, as a producer throughout the 1980s, including when I was born and my brothers. Um, and he first came in to work for the Farm Service Agency in 1993. He was appointed by President Bill Clinton uh, to be the secretary, um, the state executive director, excuse me, of the Farm Service Agency for the state of Montana. And there he was able to combine his passion for American agriculture and family farms. Um, after that, it, that position ended in 2000, and after four years in the private sector, Dad was able to work for Governor Brian Schweitzer for four and a half years, serving as his chief of staff. And in 2009, um, he was appointed by President Obama, again, to be the state executive director of the Farm Service Agency. And in Dad's words, he was recycled. <laughs> but it wasn't going to end there. On July 1st, 2011, President Obama appointed him to be administrator of the Farm Service Agency, which is the head of the entire um, Farm Service Agency. This is the USDA's second largest program following only the Forest Service. And so tonight I am very proud to be able to welcome my dad here to my school and to present him in a means of show and tell, I guess. <laughs> and he's going to talk about the role that the Farm Service Agency plays in the discussion, drafting, and adoption of the 2012 Farm Bill. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, why don't we go ahead, go ahead, let's introduce the other panelists. Then we're going to have you all make it to that. I'd like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Jean. She has worked with Max Blockus since 1974. She is the uh, in state economic development director. Uh, she lives in Billings. Uh, she graces us today driving away from uh, Lewistown, so thank you much for that. Um, she is quoted by Jen Ewing as saying, If you could bottle and sell this woman's work ethic, you would be rich. <laughs> <laughs> She is also worked on the farm bills of 2000 to 2008. So thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce Ryan McCormick. He is currently vice president of the Montana Grain Brewers Association. He's also chair of the Fertilizer Advisory Committee, a graduate of Wheat Industry Leaders of Tomorrow and Wheat Leaders of the Future. And he currently operates a grain farm in Kremlin, Montana, the area of Kremlin, Montana. So we're going to start by asking each of our panelists to just make a few introductory comments. So Bruce, what we can Well, thanks very much for the chance to get out here. It is really good to be home. 
And uh, it's interesting to be uh, introduced by your daughter. Um, I, I did spend two and a half days here back in the fall of 1974. Uh, and then when I was standing in line to pay my fees, I turned around to a friend, uh, Benny Everett from Anaconda, and said, Penny, I don't want to be a lawyer, and left. <laughs> <laughs> now, my dad, or grandpa, has been mad at me ever since. He wanted a lawyer in the family, so thank God Haley uh, <laughs> came along and decided, uh, you know, maybe grandpa will be over being mad at me, finally, after 35 years. Um, Again, I really appreciate the chance to get back here. Um, it's, it's good to be home. It's an honor to be here. Um, I got here once by myself, and now it took Haley and Kristen uh, to get me here. I always really appreciated Kristen uh, when she was counsel for our farm. Uh, and I want to recognize somebody who has been a great help to me uh, as state executive director and in this position. Uh, from the Office of General Counsel of the USDA, Mark Lodeen. Uh, Mark knows more about agricultural law than anybody. He spent a great deal of time trying to keep me out of trouble, uh, not always successfully, uh, but his efforts were always much appreciated. Uh, and while I don't know Ryan well, I know how hard it is to farm in the Kremlin area. It doesn't rain as much there as it does in some other parts of the state. And so for any family that's been around as long as his family has, uh, they are pretty darn good at what they do. And then, of course, Liz, who I've had the great pleasure to work with for a long time, another person who not only helps keep me out of trouble, but uh, it's been, there's, it's just kind of incalculable the amount of good that she has done working for Senator Bacchus for the state of Montana over the years. And by the way, she just happened to brought over from Billings uh, for the event tonight. So, as I said, an amazing work that they do. So, let's see. Thanks. Here. Well, I, I do currently operate a grain farm around the Montana area, and I'm not sure I'm in the class of the two individuals beside me, but uh, this is my, my side volunteer job that uh, takes up quite a bit of my time for the next four years. Uh, I guess I want to talk a little bit about what uh, Montana Grain Growers does. We're a grassroots organization made up of farmers from around the state of Montana. We represent 5.5 million acres in the state. and. Uh, Basically what we do, we're a lobby group. We, we change and affect farm bill policy. We, uh, we try to work with, with Senator Fox's staff. We, we work on problems within our state. And, and uh, basically we try to represent our industry as best we can. And um, I'm listening with Senator Fox's office in Billings. Um, I've worked with him for a very long time, but not all on agriculture issues. I have to say that um, the egg industry in Montana is an industry that you'd be very proud of, and it's been actually a joy to um, learn and grow with them. Um, I have learned a lot working uh, the number of farm bills that I have, and every time it's brand new. So um, with the two here, I basically am not qualified to talk about the policy portion of this. We have a legislative staffer in Washington, D.C. Her name is Alexis Taylor. And when I saw all of the um, all of the questions and, and how direct they were, how they were directed to make policy, what I did was called her up and said, Alexis, I could, be in I could get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Might help into a lot of trouble. So um, what she said was, she is planning to come up to the state at the beginning of April. She would very much would like to redirect this invitation. And um, she would very much like to sit down with you and just talk about the farm bill process and what she goes through as a legislative staffer in Washington, D.C. If that is something that you're interested in, I will work with Kristen to make that happen. Um, Jen Ewan from our Missoula office in the back, attended law school graduate, and um, we'll work to make that happen because she is truly a joy. She works very, very hard. Um, she is our staff person for the Senate Ag Committee and can just explain a lot of, of the issues that you're going to be talking about tonight. So if I defer some of the questions, please understand that it's something that I feel that she's better equipped to handle. And um, 
but I'm going to also be taking notes just because I want her to know um, how you guys are, are really working, you know, this issue, and that's very important to our state. So I can make some preliminary, but um, I'm not the staff person that probably want to talk to him. Well, we're glad we're here. We are sure will enjoy talking with you. So we're going to focus tonight on some certain aspects of the Farm Bill. We're going to talk about some direct payments, what we call countercyclical payments, the Conservation Reserve or CRP program, and multi um crop insurance. And just before we start, I'm going to give you a little bit of background now about some different types of payments that farmers are eligible for under the current Farm Bill. Okay. This, and by the way, I want to thank Rachel Clark for letting me use several slides that she compiled in one of her um, independent studies in AFOL. But we're talking about the uh, farm safety net a lot tonight. And we have commodity programs that um, pay, for example, direct payments. We have risk management. We're not going to talk much about disaster assistance. I'm sure it'll come up at some level. So let's start with direct payments. Farmers are eligible to receive from the government each year a direct payment. And it's not based on what the car farmer plants today. It's based on the farmer's past production and past yield. And there's only a 10 commodities eligible for these payments. Wheat, corn, grain, barley, all in Montana, some crops not grown in Montana and oil seeds such as canola and sunflowers, yeah, okay? Now look at what's not covered. Approximately two-thirds of the value of U.S. agricultural products do not get direct payments. Honey, hay, um, vegetables, fruits. So it's primarily field, what I call field crops, that are eligible for these direct payments. Now, they were projected in the 2008 Farm Bill to be um, $4.9 billion per year. And you can see this green is the average of the payments that farmers get. You can see about what percentage it makes up of payments. In the gray, we'll talk about those are payments fixed on prices. This is our conservation reserve payments and other payments such as natural disaster. So, in 2008, the Congress established, here's what each farmer gets for these eligible commodities as a direct payment. Let's focus on wheat, 52 cents a bushel. Whether you plant it or not, based on your past production, your base acres, you get 52 cents a bushel each year, subject to certain payment limitations. Corn, 28. Barley, 24 cents, okay? So that's a direct payment, and those are very much um, at issue in this farm bill. So, for example, Joe, average wheat farm, 2,000 base acres, 79. He would get 2,079 acres, then they take only a percentage of that, which this year is 83.3%, times 52 cents a bushel, let's assume a 40 bushel acre historic yield. He's gonna get on that 2,000 acre farm, $36,000 in direct payments each year. Okay. Counter cyclical payments are only paid when market prices go below, below a congressionally stated market price. And again, it's based on historic production and a farmer's base acres, not what they're actually uh, planting today. The same 10 commodities we looked at, plus our new pulse crops, which I just found out yesterday. Montana is the number one producer of pulse crops, peas, lentils, in the nation. Here are your um, trigger um, prices. So if wheat goes below 417 a bushel, and then they also subtract um, the direct payment, farmers would get a payment when prices basically fall low. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just kidding. What I'll also say is wheat hasn't gotten many countercyclical payments in the past few years because prices are above that trigger price. Other crops perhaps have, maybe soybeans have. Some Okay, now, here's the problem with countercyclical payments. A farmer can recognize a, a terrible loss because of a natural disaster in his or her particular area. But because overall in the nation market prices are okay, the farmer isn't going to get a cyclical payment. The ACRE program, which you'll probably hear talk about tonight, tries to um, provide coverage when 
there's a serious loss as a result of a disaster. So that's a different program we'll hear about. That's also triggered by losses. So our trigger payments, you know, are kind of cyclical. You can see what happened in 2005. Does anyone remember what sort of with that market conditions that were going on then, bad wheat prices. You can see they had a lot higher payments in 2005, and these past few years, not as many. Now, there are annual payment limitations, basically $40,000 per farmer for your direct payments, $65,000 per farmer for your kind of cyclical payments. Um, and if you're married, with a good reason to get married, those limits don't. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop there. Um, and let's move on to some questions about these commodity payments. So first, if you come back and talk, turn the spotlight on. <laughs> so Ryan, I think I'll start with you with this one. Farms are doing pretty well right now, it's at least wheat farms. Um, market prices are good. How is this going to factor into decisions about the commodity-based programs that we just talked about in the market? It's very much harder to defend uh, our program payments when, when we're having record level incomes, especially with the budgetary concerns we have on the national level. Uh, but, but the problem is that everybody in Ag, Ag, Ag recognizes that, uh, that we have a high amount of risk going on. There will be a downturn in the Ag economy. So at some point, these will become very valid to us again. But it's hard to, to uh, convince our urban brethren of the risk we're actually taking on when they see record high profits. It's in the papers, it's in Washington Post, it's everywhere. But, but we all know that at some point we'll have a, a weather disaster, an economic disaster, something will happen that we'll, we'll really need our safety net to make sure that we have a good food supply and a good national food supply. Chris Liz, would either of you want to add? Well, you know, the we need to go back in history and understand why the safety net was created back in the 1930s. Uh, you look back at pictures of the Dust Bowl in a time when one third of the country was ill-nourished, ill-housed, uh, and unemployed, uh, and the food security of the nation really was at risk. Uh, our productive capacity was literally blowing away uh, in dust storms that actually darkened the skies in Washington, D.C. and Europe, out of not only the Dust Bowl, uh, but Montana and North Dakota and South Dakota as well. And sort of the policymakers in the country came to the collective understanding that we really needed to create a federal safety net under agriculture, that it wasn't something that could be done at the state level. And so there was an effort made with the Agricultural Adjustment Act back in 1933. Uh, and it was at that time that they decided that the major commodities produced in the country that we really relied on for our food supply, wheat, corn, barley, soybeans, rice, cotton, uh, those were the commodities that were focused on. And it's no coincidence that still today when Kristen puts up the picture of the crops that are subject to direct payments, that those are the crops that we're still talking about. So the Agricultural Adjustment Act was found unconstitutional, and so Congress went back to work and created the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1936. Uh, that is really the act that founded not only the agency that I work for, the Farm Service Agency, uh, but the Farmers Home Administration uh, that administered housing programs and economic development programs in rural America, as well as a loan program for farmers and ranchers, and the Soil Conservation Service uh, that was founded at that time under Hugh Hammond Bennett's leadership to try to get control of the Dust Bowl. And what basically it, it was, was a recognition that we couldn't jeopardize the food security of our nation. And that has been the underlying sort of bipartisan agreement that has withstood the test of time basically over the last 75 years with every four to five years, the writing of a farm bill. 
Uh, we enjoy in this country today the most abundant, most affordable, and safest food supply in the world. We pay less of our dollar than anybody else in the world for food. In return for that, what we do is we create a safety net through the federal government to try to make sure that food security for our country continues. And right now, we're going to debate again what constitutes that safety net. Now, one of the really interesting things about it is that the debate in farm bills has historically not been a partisan debate. You know, you see a lot on TV now about partisan gridlock in Washington, D.C. I'm happy to say that you know, the issues uh, in agriculture normally aren't partisan issues between Democrats and Republicans. What they are is issues over commodities, uh, whether you're a rice producer or cotton producer in the South, you've got a different perspective on things than Ryan does here, uh, and they have a different perspective than the, than the corn and soybean farmers in the Midwest. Uh, but, but nonetheless, those differences that we have uh, between commodities and regions create uh, just as much difference of opinion over what a farm bill ought to be than the difference that the Democrat and Republican uh, does on other pieces of legislation going through the Congress. So, so while, like I say, when I go up, as I did a couple of weeks ago, and testify in front of the Senate Agriculture Committee and Senator Baucus, I get pretty similar questions uh, from Democrats and Republicans. Uh, what I get are very pointed questions based on where they're from in the country and what crops are grown in their state. So I think what will characterize uh, this farm bill, though, as different from past farm bill debates are a couple of things. Um, one is that, you know, there was kind of a consensus until recently on direct payments. Uh, but that consensus uh, doesn't seem to be there anymore. Um, up until 1996, with the passage of that bill, the payments that farmers received were always in return for the farmer doing something like reducing their acreage on their farm. But with the 1996 Farm Bill, uh, payments were decoupled. And they were also set, as Kristen indicated, at set levels. Because in addition to before 96, farmers having to, say, reduce the acreage on their place 15%, uh, the payments also varied depending on market conditions, much like the countercyclical payments do now. So you've got a situation where, as Ryan indicated, it is really hard to explain to the public right now why their taxpayer dollars are being used for direct payments to farmers when we're getting record prices for our commodities and farm income is at record high levels. The other thing that's going to affect this farm bill debate is that the law of the land right now is that unless Congress and the President change this, uh, next January, $1.4 trillion of budget sequestration will automatically go into effect. Every dollar that we are talking about here today is potentially subject to those budget reduction measures. And so that is creating sort of an unprecedented downward pressure on the writing of a farm bill and on the whole federal budget process that is going to, I think, exacerbate those differences between regions of the country and commodities in ways that we've never seen before. I agree. I agree, Bruce, because we saw direct payments come up during the discussion of the 08 bill. And that was sort of a, that was sort of a, um, you know, a, Divisive. Well, it was divisive, but it also, because the issue was raised, but not, you know, not impacted in 08, they knew that it was going to come up again. Congress knew that it was going to be something that was going to be on the table. And so, you know, maybe beating it back, you know, in the 08 Farm Bill gave some room, some breather room to try to figure out 
you know, how to deal with what was coming up in this current farm bill in the 2012, well, I mean, we had to extend, we'll have to extend if we don't um, pass a farm bill um, by the time it expires. So what we're saying here is, is there are some pressures that we knew were coming, um, but the budget pressures are the pressures that, because we don't know exactly how large, you know, a cut we're gonna have to, we're gonna be talking about, um, this is pretty fluid, you know, in some sense. They, they do have baselines, they do have figures that are going out before the Senate and the House Ag Committees, but um, one of the concerns that we have, that um, the Senate has is, you know, we have a, a baseline that they're looking at for all of these programs that Kristen put down. Um, and basically it comes to, what did she say? She said, um, it, it basically comes to a figure of, let me just see. Um, I keep on changing this. So the House budget call last year for $178 billion, billion dollars in cuts from the Farm Bill. Um, that level is going to be difficult for the Senate to accept. So here we are challenging the House figures and, and maybe moving up some of the, the programs that are looking for cuts. I mean, if direct payments come up, which, I mean, it's something that a lot of ag groups are saying, yeah, go ahead and cut direct payments because we want these other programs to be inserted into the farm, but we want this support. Um, do you trade direct payments for crop insurance? you know, a safety net? Do you trade, um, you know, livestock programs for some, you know, not sugar beet, but some other program that you're looking to support? So basically, um, this is a huge discussion about what agricultural commodities and what um, livestock programs and, you know, what kind of support we're gonna be giving our food security, food security of this nation. I mean, how are we gonna talk about food security so that somebody like, you know, our, our wheat producers are going to be able to have, um, are going to have that farm income that they know they'll be here, they'll be there next year. Um, I think Bruce alluded to it earlier. This isn't going to be a partisan debate. This is going to be an urban versus rural debate, you know, realistically. And luckily, we do have senators in place in the Senate that, that have some power that are senators that, that are going to support our aid. Commodity titles, and, and hopefully, hopefully we can we can get some pressure put in the right places. Uh, Liz uh, alluded to the fact that, that some groups came out not supporting DP. The deep Well, I talk in acronyms. I'll try to not do that. <laughs> everything's an acronym. Does so. anyway. The direct payment. Uh, but the, the two most utilized things in Montana, crop insurance is number one, and we, we've recognized that we have to save crop insurance for Montana producers. Number two utilized would be direct payment. Now, we could maybe shift some, some money out of DP into other things because what we're hearing from the Senate is that DP probably is not politically going to survive the budget cuts. So we have to try to come up with a new plan. During the super committee, uh, most people sat and didn't do anything. Egg decided they were going to be proactive. We came up with a plan. We came up with a cut. We had a direction. Uh, the downside to that was that we came up with a number of, of what we go from 35 billion in Title I to 23. So that number is out there in the press. Positive or negative, I'm not sure. But, but I think being proactive so we can pick and choose what we think will be most effective for our producers is probably a positive rather than sitting back and just hoping nothing happens. Because realistically, the four percent cut that uh, Bruce alluded to would be would be best for ag. Period. And do you think there's any possibility that there would be an expansion of the crops eligible for direct payments to fruits and vegetables, for example? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, look. Uh, I, I think the, the question sort of answers itself because in a time when there's downward pressure on the budget, uh, chances are you're not going to see any expansion. The question is going to be who's going to take less, not who's going to get more. I, I want to just put this in perspective for the state of Montana, give you an idea of what the Farm Service Agency puts out in payments in a year for some of these programs. Uh, the direct payments last year in Montana 
a total of over $88 million. Conservation Reserve Program payments in the state over $90 million. Payments under the 2008 Farm Bill Disaster Programs, Supplemental Revenue Assurance Program, or SURE, uh, has been the last couple of years over $100 million statewide. Uh, the ACRE program, uh, Average Crop Election Program that Kristen talked about before, which only triggered one year in Montana, uh, back in 2009, wheat producers got almost $20 million out of that program. So we are not talking inconsequential sums of money for our state here. Uh, we're talking, uh, you know, sometimes the difference between a good year and a not so good year in a lot of farming conditions. <clears throat> so the stakes are high for our state. And I think at one point in time, fruit and vegetables weren't necessarily looking for something for a support program like direct payment. They were looking for marketing funding. Um, so they were sort of picking and choosing, but they can read the tea leaves as well as anybody else. And they know that in this environment, coming after something like a direct payment um, for their commodity would be very, very difficult. Although, <laughs> that doesn't stop anybody from doing it. <laughs> well, and I read on um, the various news reports that in Obama's pro proposed budget or some of his proposals, he does want to eliminate direct deposits. Do you think that the administration is going to support that? Uh, look, the, the administration um, has, the president has expressed skepticism about direct payments uh, for the last couple of years because of concern about making payments to farmers when you've got record high income. So this year, the uh, president opposed the elimination of direct payments. But here's what we support as an alternative to that. And now, this is something that actually makes a great deal of sense for Montana because these were programs that the Montana Congressional Delegation, all three members of them, fought very hard for in the 2008 Farm Bill. And I alluded to them earlier. There were five permanent disaster programs, and what's funny about it is they called them permanent, but they're anything but. Uh, but they were five disaster programs that were enacted as part of the 2008 Farm Bill. What's significant about that is that programs like this had never been part of the Farm Bill until 2008. And it was only on the insistence of the congressional delegations from Montana and this part of the country that these programs were put in that Farm Bill. Included among them were the Supplemental Revenue Assurance Program, which acts in concert with crop insurance to provide additional benefits to producers in the case of severe losses. Livestock forage program, which provides benefits to livestock producers when you've got drought conditions and they lose pasture and forage. The livestock indemnity program, which again provides help to producers if they lose livestock because of a natural disaster. Uh, the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program, which basically fills in everything that the Livestock Forage Program and Livestock Indemnity Program don't cover. And then the Tree Assistance Program, uh, where if producers lose orchard trees, for example, uh, in a storm due to a natural disaster, uh, they can get some help in replacing them. And we've actually got a pretty uh, important little uh, high value uh, cherry uh, industry up in the Flathead area that's benefited over the years from that program. But I think it's important to say why the crop insurance program, this safety net is so important. When we had ad hoc disasters or, or disaster assistance come in, there were, there were years when producers didn't get um, this this payment for that disaster until two years after the disaster had passed. How many producers can actually, you know, uh, can actually stay above water if they don't get assistance at the time that it's needed? And this is this is a, a you know this is part of the what's critical about. 
the safety net argument that we have right now, but we still have producers who say, you know, between the SURE program and other programs, we're still not getting it in a timely fashion. Unfortunately, it's the way Congress wrote the SURE program to try to ensure that all of the, the disaster was accounted for. That's a problem, and it's something you know that they've been discussing. I think they'll be discussing it in this final farm bill hearing that's coming up tomorrow. Um, but to, to expand on the SURE program a little bit, uh, the SURE program actually didn't come from uh, through the Ag title. It actually came from the Finance Committee via Senator Bacchus. It was basically his baby. He said, this is going to go through, and that's how it's going to happen. And, and so it's not within our baseline, which which is problematic if we want to try to save a program like SURE, because it, realistically, the funding never showed up in the in the Ag title. And I do believe they passed legislation, so it couldn't, that could never happen again. You guys are probably know more than I about that. But uh, back to uh, President Obama, uh, I have it underlined here about the direct payment, not helping the farmers they should. Well, I don't know who he thinks that it should help, but there's no doubt about who would be affected the most. Uh, the first place I think you'll see the DP really affect is rural Main Street, because typically those farms say they get a $20,000 payment, and that's, that's cash income, guaranteed income, and that ends up disposable income, which is goes into new vehicles or updated vehicles, uh, remodeled kitchen, you name it. So the first thing you're gonna see is, is Main Street businesses have difficulty making it work if DP goes by the wayside. The other side of it is too, is, is uh, I think what you're gonna see is the, the beginning farmers are gonna struggle without a DP, small farmers are gonna struggle without a DP, and the highly leveraged farmers are gonna be the ones affected, probably in about that order. And oftentimes people tell me, well, how come a large farmer is getting a bigger payment? Isn't he gonna be more effective, affected by it than, than one, one with a smaller payment? But that's not, not really the case because if you look at a farmer that has 100,000 net income, 40,000 of that, which is the max direct payment, is coming from DP. So then he loses that DP, he's at 60,000. Well, 60,000 is still a pretty darn good job even by attorney standards. <laughs> okay, and uh, then there's a farmer who's making 50,000. He's only getting half of that in the DP, or 20,000 out of the DP. So you subtract that 20,000 out of his net income. Then he's only making 30,000. Well, that's not the greatest job in the world. Well, he's probably gonna have time to think about, and, and most farmers are capable of other jobs and management. He, he may really look at moving on, getting out of the egg industry. So the ones that are affected are, are gonna be the young, the, the small and the leveraged, and, and to me, that's what the, the program is here to support. Established farms are gonna probably survive. Main Street businesses are gonna be the worst affected. Well, Ryan, following up on that, do you think a possible proposal is to limit direct payments to farms on $250,000 in gross sales, or? I think the, the, the uh, DP is politically at risk, no matter what. Uh, I, I don't think the AGI is really going to play into it, to be honest with you. The AG, uh, adjusted gross income. The AGI is uh, it's such a moving target because you have high input risk. We have huge swings now in, in commodity prices. We can have a run from $7 a week to, in 08, we saw $20 for a week. Well, of course you're going to have a farm that, that goes over a million dollars in revenue for that year if you happen to have all spring being sold at all at that price, which is possible. But the next year, you may have a significant loss. So do you want to penalize him for being successful? I, I, it just doesn't really make sense because, I mean, this is a, we, we, you shouldn't ever, ever penalize success because that's what our country's been built on. Capitalism is, is, comes from that standpoint. Well, but I, I think we need to keep in mind, again, the, the, the political and budget context that we're working in. Uh, again, there's downward pressure on the budget. Uh, the, the group that got together of House and Senate Ag leaders that put the proposal together last fall called for $23 billion in reductions over 10 years. 
Uh, the president's proposal is for 33. Chances are it's going to end up somewhere between those figures. Uh, it's going to have to because, again, every egg dollar we're talking about here is on the table during this debate. Our argument uh, in the Obama administration is that what we need to do is move that funding base from the direct payment program over to these traditional safety net type programs. Uh, the livestock programs I talked about and a SURE type program. Now, I'll tell you, the SURE program itself, uh, it put a lot of money into Montana, but as Ryan and Liz both talked about, it put it in late because the way it was designed, basically, we administer Farm Service Agency two years after the disaster. So what we've recommended, again, as an administration, is that a program be designed similar to SURE that gets the benefits to the producer faster. Well, the point is, we think that a safety net needs to be sensitive to prices, to revenue, and to production, uh, as opposed to having the same amount of payments every year regardless of revenue, price, and production. We think that is more consistent with the way the safety nets operated historically, and it's a lot more defensible to the public to go out and say we're making farmers payments uh, because they've had disastrous production losses, disastrous revenue losses, or disastrous prices. And we've been working on a program just like Bruce is talking about with Senator Bacchus's office, uh, the Bacchus student plan is what, what we're calling it, or comrade doing, or whichever one you may, may want to pick. But basically, the differences are, the old SURE program was, it had to be a cap, in your county you had a loss, or your continuous county had to be called disaster, I believe. And then, uh, and then your farm would then also have that equation put to it, and if your farm showed a loss, then you would get a payment. Well, the, one, the plan we're working on now is a farm level payment by commodity, so it triggers for every commodity, so you grow five commodities, they'll look at each one of them separately on your farm, and it will be triggered by your net income and your expenses are all figured in. So, and it is more defensible. There's no doubt about that. The public understands when you have a loss, you get payment. Now you'll see that, that this proposal, there's a counter proposal to the farm level to be at a county level so that it's easier to administer, um, you know, they can, they can actually um, address it more quickly. It's, it's going to be difficult to try to, I mean, poor groups, his county offices in Montana, they have to deal with everything that Congress throws at them, no matter what the timing, all of their deadlines stay in place, plus whatever we send them. So you have people walking in saying, hello, I want to apply for this program. They have to explain everything to them, have all the forms out to them, and, and be able to walk them through a process that they don't yet understand. So when we, so the counter to the farm level program would be something that'd be a little bit easier to administer, but not provide quite the benefit that we're talking about that a farm level would. Well, the ones that are supporting a county level trigger are, are mostly back east or in the middle Midwest where they have uh, smaller counties and, and their, their variability in yields are not as dramatic as, as uh, Montana. You could go from the north end of, of my county, Hill County, to the south end. North end may be having a disaster and the south end may be having a bumper crop. And they'll be all over in between that. So we're going to be very adamant, and Senator Fox talks will too, that, that we need a farm level trigger because a county level trigger really does not do, to do the trick for Montana. Can we talk a little bit about the process? So Liz, maybe could you explain? Um, we have the Senate Agriculture Committee, the House Agriculture Committee. Are, are they going to be working on separate bills? Are they going to be working together? And then Ryan, could you tell us how players like Gray Rivers come to the table in your role? Well, they, they will, both the Senate and the House, put their, um, their versions of, their, of the bill out and they hold hearings. Um, for example, tomorrow we will have the last Farm Bill hearing on the risk management um, title. And so that basically is the safety net discussion, um, the crop insurance discussion that we've, that we've been having right now. Um, they have sort of jump-started this process. 
uh, because of the super committee discussion and making sure that that is, um, as, as Ryan said, inserted, being proactive to say, you know, we want to protect, you know, this agriculture industry in this country. And this is, you know, this is the compromise that we've come up with. It's provided a starting point that something that the super committee, um, that the Senate Ag Committee um, was, was supportive of. And so they've taken sort of a different approach than the House Ag Committee has um, in terms of that starting point. So they have two different starting points. They will hope to come together. Let's see, Alexis said that um, they hope to have their respective bills passed by June um, because the current farm bill expires on September 30th. And it took six months for 08 to go into conference, for the 08 farm bill to go into conference. So because this is a much more difficult budget environment, they're assuming it's going to take longer. We're already behind April. And so right now, um, they're really pushing, if they don't get it passed, they would probably look at an extension. But um, that, that trigger, that has a whole different uh, budget trigger too. So we want to get under the budget trigger that is the most um, advantageous to agriculture. Otherwise, we get stuck with these budget definitions that are just not good. Uh, and I guess, just, just so I don't make sure everybody understands why, why I, I talk about Senator Vox's office so much. Senator Vox sits on the Ag Committee. Senator Tester does not. Uh, uh, Congressman Reber also is not on the Ag Committee in the House. So basically, a lot of work is done through Senator Vox's office on, on all the Ag issues. Um, we should probably talk about it. The, the, far, the Ag Committee is an authorizing committee. So it, it authorizes these programs to be put into law. The um, Senator Kester and Congressman Reber both sit on appropriations committees. And those committees do annual appropriations on a year to year basis to run the, um, the programs under the So when we're working on, on these ag issues and Title I issues with, with Senator Barkas' office, she alluded to Alexis earlier. Uh, Alexis Taylor is his ag LA. And, and uh, our staffer, Lou Raska, our executive vice president, she, uh, she is, is, is nationally recognized one of the, the best people in the nation to vet these programs, see how they're going to work for ag in the nation and for Montana. Uh, we, we're steadily, every time we get one, we're, we're tearing it apart, we're seeing how it's going to work, putting it through different scenarios, mm -hmm. making sure that it's going to be positive for Montana producers. And uh, Senator Box's office has been great to work with us. Alexis has been outstanding. It's, it's amazing. She she came on a year ago, year ago, about a year ago. And and you want to talk about a lot of information to try to digest at one time. She did come from Tom Harkin's office, which is in the country. <laughs> and, and she was up to speed in a month. It was amazing. Well, um, you know, it's really important to have somebody um, that has the farm background. Yeah, her family farms in Iowa, so yeah, she, she has some understanding of the risk we take and, right. and great, great asset to Montana. But we also have Lola on speed dive, and probably they Brian is too. <laughs> <laughs> and they've all got me on speed dive. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about countercyclical payments, and then we'll open it up to some questions on these types of payments, and then move on to our other issues. So, um, what do you think is going to happen? Stay. Stay. Well, in the Bacchus Dune plan, there is countercyclical did stay. Now, Montana hasn't really got to, to participate in countercyclical ever. And the reason being, most, well, part of the reason I should say, is the direct payment was subtracted right off the top of it. So, if the direct payment goes, there may be potential we could see some benefit from the countercyclical. Uh, that's sort of an unknown. When we have ran the numbers, it does appear that at times we probably would participate in that program. So it would benefit Montana producers, I think. And basically what the counter cyclical does is it, it uh, protects us from huge market swings. Uh, the downside to it is it, there's WTO implications, World Trade Organization, that, uh, that potentially could be problematic for us as far as WTO. I'm sure some of you followed the WTO cotton case where we're actually now paying uh, Brazil for a lot of money for a ridiculous <laughs> amount for nothing, in my opinion. <laughs> 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 
I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a sacred fit in with it. It was just going to continue the acre program. Well, look, I, I hesitate to, to make predictions. Um, Liz and uh, Alexis uh, and Ryan are in a lot better position than I am. I, I think what you're going to see is they're going to take the SURE program and the APER program uh, and counter cyclical and try to come up with something, like I say, that protects against revenue downside, price downside, and production downside. Um, and uh, that is not going to be easy. Uh, but, you know, I think that both Liz and Ryan have put their finger on the stakes for Montana in this. And this is where, and I've got to be a little bit careful because while well, on one hand I'm in Montana and have a kind of personal rooting interest in this, as an administrator of the agency, I can't have. But here's the issue. Uh, with any kind of safety net program within the Farm Service Agency, what's the trigger going to be? And I know this, this is really arcane stuff, but a heck of a lot is riding on it for our state. Because if the trigger is at farm level, uh, the programs historically work pretty well for Montana. Uh, but if you pull the trigger up to a county or area level, uh, so that you got to have a disaster in a whole county out before program triggers, that doesn't work so well for Montana. My home county, Shoto County, uh, it's almost 4,000 square miles. Uh, you go to the Midwest, and the counties are the size of the township. You know, 36 square miles. So they got a lot better chance of making a county or area trigger work because they got a lot better chance of the disaster covering 36 square miles than we've got of one that's going to cover 4,000 square miles. So again, it might kind of sound like we're talking about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin here, but this this is a big deal for Montana. The, the reason they're, the argument they're using for a county level trigger is the CBO actually scores it less for budgetary reasons. So that's basically what they're standing on is the score less. But absolutely, Montana, it just will not work for it. We're, we're too big. And, and most of the West is like that. So we do have allies in this fight. And we've seen those um, that happen with other insurance programs. I mean, our fights have been with pilot insurance programs that it rained at, you know, at one corner of the county and it didn't rain in the other and they're trying to, you know, one is trying to collect because they have to see a disaster and the other is saying, you know, what are you talking about? So we've had those issues come up before with insurance and hopefully that experience will be advantageous to us. Okay, so first of all, let me get a time check. What time is it? Oh, so any, before we move on to conservation of this um, reserve program and crop insurance, any questions on the discussion so far on the legislative process in general? Yeah, um, so President Obama um, appointed the Simpson Bowles Commission. And Simpson Bowles Commission, and I know they talked about um, reducing as part it was to reduce the deficit was the uh, and uh, and my understanding is that they talked about um, reducing the deficit through through the farm through uh, through the farm subsidies and everything by reducing it by three bi three billion per year and then getting and getting rid of DP and um, getting rid of CSP which is a conservation services program and uh, the market access program I think and, and I think some farm and some some other farm subsidies and I know that Senator Baucus said that was too too those were too. Uh, Deep of cuts. And I know that President Obama chose not to endorse that as well. And I'm wondering, is that because of the deep is the DP or is that are those those programs are those on the on the cutting block as well? Or I think there was talk of CRP reduction, CSP. I, I haven't heard that anywhere. CSP is Conservation Security Program, uh, and, and MAP, as far as I know, we haven't heard it. That's actually a very small portion of the budget. Yeah. Really insignificant. Uh, it's market access program is what it stands for, and it actually is, is uh, for our export uh, business. 
Yeah, let me, the, the components of the President's A um, deficit reduction proposal are the elimination of direct payments um, and to reduce the Conservation Reserve Program statutory cap from 32 million acres to 30 million acres. Now, bear in mind, uh, during the discussion last fall on the House and Senate Ag Leaders proposal, they actually proposed to reduce that Conservation Reserve Program cap down to 25 million acres. Um, and to uh, the President's proposal would save about $977 million in CRP over uh, 10 years. And then in the crop insurance program, to reduce the rate of return for the insurance companies down to 12%, uh, that's where it's supposed to be, but it hasn't quite got there yet. Uh, to cap the administrative overhead of the program at nine, uh, nine tenths of a billion dollars with annual adjustments for inflation to price the cap policies, which are the catastrophic level uh, insurance policies available for 300 bucks at a level more commensurate with the risk and to add two basis points to the insurance coverages that are subsidized above 50% coverage. That was a total of $33 billion. But the other part of that was, is that we would throw back in, like I said, those five disaster programs uh, that were crafted in the 2008 Farm Bill, because again, we think those are essential components of the safety net. Um, and like I said, uh, we know the SURE program doesn't work, so we're saying either the SURE program or a similar program uh, in the way it uh, is sensitive to price reductions, revenue reductions, or production uh, cuts. I would argue for like the SURE program did work. But it's well, the, the, it, it, the, the, the issue was timeliness right. of the payments. That's the main thing we're after, and it's SURE, is we've got to get those payments out there. Uh, I mean, right now, we're actually administering the 2010 SURE program. This is, by my recollection, 2012. Uh, this is a little late to be doing that, and again, it's because of the way the program was designed. And when you talk to a producer who comes, you know, who says, I paid my premium, you know, here I am, waiting, coming in to, you know, collect on, on that payment, well, guess what? Oh. And you're telling him or her that they have to wait for, like, you know, a, a year to 18 months or, or up to two years? It, it actually is such a struggle for them, they're coming back and saying, I'm not sure it makes sense for me to actually get, you know, take out that crop insurance. Although, it's eligibility for other farm programs. So they have to have some kind of insurance in order to do that. Uh, yes. Yeah, Bruce alludes to that is the whole problem for sure. I mean, I actually had that situation. I participated in the SURE program in 09. And, and then all that, and I get my payment, which was also a record income year for me. So then I have a tax situation, which is not a bad problem, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I could use that money in 09. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, that's, that's well, let's talk a little bit about uh, Conservation Reserve Program. Now, we can only touch the surface of this. I encourage you all to sign up and take a cultural law next year, if you haven't. And Mark Ludine will come talk to us about CRP contracts in more detail. It's a voluntary program. Farmers um, or other ranchers, landowners in agriculture basically receive annual rental payments from the government and perhaps some cost share uh, payments for some conservation improvements. Um, and then they leave their land life out. They don't actually uh, plant a crop. And nat nationwide, as of February, for general sign-up types of contracts, it was $47 an acre. I don't know, um, I just got that statistic off the FSA. I don't know what it is in Montana. I know it's slower than that. It's about more like. Yeah, I forget how well it was. It's under $30 an acre. It's no, not under 30. No, it's not. Under about 35 to 40 someplace in there, I would think. So we're a little bit lower on um, average rental in Montana. And of course, it does help address the erosion issues. Pheasant hunters love it, um, it's improved our 
habitat for birds. And now, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but in any single county, they don't want the whole county to go into a CRP program. That's still there. So there's a 25% um, maximum number of acres per county that can go into the program. Just some statistics as of December, again, from the Farm Services site. The number one state is Texas. Number two used to be Montana, but Kansas just jumped ahead of us. And Mo Montana is the number three state as far as total acres enrolled in this program. And look what happened in um, Montana. Oh, I said since December 2011. Since that should be September 2011, 350,000 acres have dropped out. And we'll ask why you guys think that is in just a minute. And you gave a statistic, 90 um, million dollars in, yeah. Or I got that off of, uh, not the FSA website, but. 2000, yeah, I'm talking 2000. Yeah. Okay, and as Bruce mentioned, there's a $32 million cap. Uh, right now, it's only 29 million plus acres enrolled nationwide. And just in the last two months, that has dropped from over 31 million. So we're seeing land coming out of the CRP, okay? So we'll stop there, and let's talk a little bit about CRP. Um, why do you think land is coming out of CRP? Brian, should we start with you? Sure. Uh, obviously, uh, commodity market prices have been very high. Uh, it was interesting, the western side of our county has always been a little drier than, than where we farm. And, and all summer long last summer, you'd see smoke from over here and smoke from over there. And people were burning it off, putting it back into production. Uh, I suspect that the reduction that the president uh, has in his plan from 32 to 30 will easily happen just by market commodity prices going up. And and the figures we've ran, I really think of buying closer to 25 just because of, of profitability on those acreages rather than than what they they have been for CRP contracts. The, the differences, I think, is a, a lot of our, our lands and all the whole country are now no-till and we're far better at controlling erosion. So highly erodible lands that were put in initially are now capable of farming job. So I, I think Montana will see a huge reduction in the next year, next two years really. Bruce probably has the numbers. Well, yeah, to, to, to put in perspective what um, Brian's talking about, these CRP contracts run for 10 or 15 years, most of them in Montana for 10 years. And in return for putting permanent cover on, uh, usually grass, uh, but sometimes uh, shrubs or forbs, uh, primarily in other parts of the country, or even trees in some places. Uh, but in return for taking that land out of production and putting permanent cover on it, a uh, producer receives annual rental payment. Uh, and, and so this September, uh, we're going to have about 5,500 contracts expire in Montana, totally almost 700,000 acres. We, we have the most expiring acres of any state in the country uh, this year. Next year, we've got another 367,000 acres expiring in Montana. So, as Ryan said, you know, that the issue is the market price is high, are people going to leave it in CRP or not? And we'll find out pretty soon because the general sign up where producers would have the opportunity to either rebid that acreage or bid new acreage in started yesterday uh, and it runs through April 6th. So we will we will find out pretty soon how many acres are going to be offered. And just anecdotally, um, when Senator Bach has held farm bill hearings in Montana for 02 and 08, now he heard from people who were concerned about the CRP program because it's um, it's a program that withdraws you know lands from um, production and so young, young and beginning farmers um, who are looking for um, potentially for you know to get into the program that's acreage that they can't get um, people see have seen CRP as one of the reasons that small towns were um, adversely affected because when you don't have you know that land in continual production just get payments from it you know, is somebody going to take off and become a snowbird? Or is, is somebody going to just um, shut down basically except for the rental payment, which means you don't have any equipment, you know, sales, you don't have any um, fuel sales, you don't have any input sales, you don't have anything that keeps those, you know, those communities going. And so 
population increases. Can well, to, to elaborate on that a little bit, okay, the CRP payment is, say, 40 bucks an acre, and operating costs, input costs, $150 per acre that basically is all bought within the local economy. It, it turns uh, definitely Main Street highly affected by CRP payment, I believe. And so we heard, he heard a lot about that. And, um, but you know, on the other hand, we had other producers saying, hey, this is my mainstay. This is why I'm still in agriculture. This plus a blend of something else that I'm doing really keeps me, um, keeps agriculture functioning in Montana. So maybe this is going to be a situation where because of the, the price of, you know, commodities, it, it just basically evens itself out. But there has been that underlying, um, an underlying tension with CRP. Well, well, just to give you a little background on how Montana has been doing, we've actually received over a billion dollars in sales for the fourth time here ever uh, this year. And uh, that's only happened four times. They all happened in the last five years. So in, in obviously, great, in great, great sales. So obviously, Montana has really economically profited, benefited from grain and, and those CRP acres, not only are coming out because of commodity prices, but also record deals. And the, other, the last thing that I want to say is that um, there has been a push for to see um, working lands programs like the Conservation Security Program, which turned into the Conservation what was it? Stewardship. Stewardship Program. Um, so, so people are, are seeing those kinds of are supporting those kinds of programs to keep the working lands, you know, in production, and but basically take a conservation approach to it, sort of blend the best. Of well, and one other program that was included in the 2008 Farm Bill, that we weren't quite sure how it was going to work out, but all of a sudden has become very popular, is a little program called the Transition Incentive Program, or TIP. And what that does is it allows a producer who's got an expiring CRP contract, who sells or leases their land to a new beginning farmer, uh, and leases it on a long-term basis or uh, sells it to them uh, who agrees to farm in a sustainable manner, uh, that producer can get two additional years of CRP payments, uh, which that is a, we think, great program to help transition land not only out of CRP, uh, but also into the hands of new beginning farmers out there. The rub right now is that Congress put $25 million in the pot to fund the program with, and we had to actually stop sign up for the program a couple of weeks ago because we were starting to get close to the $25 million. And there's a thing called the Anti-Deficiency Act. Uh, if we go over that, Mark smiling and nodding his head yes, uh, I go to jail. <laughs> so we decided, we decided that probably wasn't such a good idea. Uh, but here, here's, the, here's the thing right now that when I testified again in front of the Senate two weeks ago, nationwide six and a half million acres of CRP are expiring in September. Like I said, almost 700,000 of those here in Montana, over 68,000 contracts. That means potentially there's 68,000 contract holders out there who might be interested in that little program over the next few months. Uh, and unless Congress does something about it now and then, uh, we're going to miss a big opportunity to bring some new people into agriculture. Well, and I will say that one of the um, one of Alexis's folks when she comes to the state will be to meet with. Um, folks who are who have a young and beginning farmer program going up at, up at MSU extension. So she had she is really focusing on um, beginning farmer program. So uh, you mentioned too. Do you see any other programs either being enhanced in the farm bill or cut in the farm bill conservation? Well, that's Terry Times. I think. Everything can have a target on it. It, it. it just depends on, on which program. Most of the conservation programs appear to be fairly safe. Uh, public likes them, uh, urban likes them because they think of pheasants and wildlife. And, and realistically, that's been a fact that CRP has been a huge boom to wildlife in the state. I think anybody who's traveled around has seen that's quite obvious. Uh, 
I suspect that conservation title will come out pretty full. But you know, it's it's very moving target budgetary times. So if someone gets a hold of it at the right time, anything is has a bullseye on it. There is a pretty a pretty strong lobby for the conservation programs, just like for the commodities. Okay, well let's finish up with talking about crop insurance. So there's basically, at least in Montana, two different kinds of crop insurance. We're gonna spend uh, the rest of this evening talking about multi-power crop insurance. Um, which provides coverage for certain types of natural disasters, and it's a public-private partnership. Crop hail, we're not gonna talk about. That is a private insurance that's uh, administered by private insurance companies. So, so this multi-carol or FTCI program, the federal government designs it, reinsures it, um, writes the contracts, but it is actually delivered into the field to farmers through private insurance agents or selling it, writing it, helping them select the best program for them. And also there are private insurance companies who get involved in the reinsurance pool, but quite frankly, most of the riskiest pieces of property end up being fully reinsured by the federal government. So 15 private insurance companies, 15,000 agents are involved in this public-private partnership. As Bruce mentioned, um, a fully subsidized catastrophic level of insurance is provided by the federal government. They only have to pay the farmer a $300 per county per crop fee, but farmers can buy additional coverage. We call that buy-up coverage. And unlike direct payments, crop insurance is based on actual production. You can only insure what you're actually producing. Here's some statistics. Um, in 2010, we had over $2 million FDCF contracts. See that 92% are buyer. They're more than that minimum level catastrophic. Um, look at the farmer paid premiums versus the government paid. So these premiums are subsidized by the government. And then um, you know, our losses for 2010 paid. 2010 crop failures, excess moisture was the biggest. But you can see drought. Um, there is some hail coverage under the MPCI policies. Heat, other types of frost um, disasters that we're insured against. And here's kind of a map showing where the loss ratios were. Montana is one of the higher um, loss ratio states, 28. So lots of coverage across the country with this particular program. So, what do you think is going to happen with crop insurance? Let's see. Right. <laughs> well, well, crop insurance is absolutely the, uh, our membership is over and over. I mean, it's number one for Montana. Montana Green Growers absolutely use this, this program. Uh, it's not only probably the number one program for grain producers, but probably also the number one program for food security in our nation, mm -hmm. and probably our world now, really. Because 80% of Montana grain is exported. Japan obviously doesn't have enough tilled lakers. They, they are totally dependent on, on us to, to raise their food. China's similar situation. India becoming more so all the time. Uh, back to, to uh, the a and and, and uh, insurance companies. Any talk of cutting the A&O, the ones that will affect the most, again, I keep going back to rural economies, but if you continue to cut A&O to those rural economies, that's the bread and butter of the insurance companies that are that are in, small insurance companies that, that are in our state. That they, uh, they absolutely will close their doors and, and then just have to drive farther. Most of those also offer life, auto, health. So that would also be by the wayside. Uh, it, it's something that we, we, every bank requires when a young farmer comes in to get an operating note, they require that they carry federal crop insurance. And, and that's how most farmers get started, is they're leaned against that, that crop insurance. So we recognize this as our number one. It'll continue to be our number one. It appears, even budgetarily, that, that most people, urban and rural, in Congress are understanding that, that this is very important to our nation, and it appears that on the whole. Congressman, you mentioned you know, administrative and overhead costs. Just how, what's kind of the concern there that the private companies are being paid too much by the federal government to administer the programs? Right. Uh, private companies are in, a, in the business to profit. I, I mean, how else do you put it? If you cut those profits too low, they, they will 
actually they'll, they'll quit or sell or whatever may happen, probably consolidate. We actually owned a crop insurance company, a small one that we purchased several years ago, and, and we were one of those victims. It didn't appear that we were profitable enough to worry about it anymore. So we sold our business to a larger one that's 40 miles away. And, and you will see that it, it's bad for rural economy. Our insurance office closed. It, it's not that it wasn't profitable or wouldn't have been profitable. It just wasn't worth our time anymore. And it'll be a negative effect on, on rural economies to even think about it. Uh, Factory did put a study out, and I'm sure Bruce cringed when he saw it, but to have FSA administer crop insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no offense to FSA, but, but they, <laughs> they are understaffed right now. Right. And administering the programs they have is, is difficult enough rather than loading them up with another program that is the most massive program under the farm bill as far as to egg producers. So, uh, and of course, back we twisted it, NASCO actually put it out, which is the, the National Association of Employees for FSA, I believe, or some, yeah. something yeah. similar. Yeah. Yeah. And very difficult to, to even believe that could be possible. Uh, one of the arguments that, that I found quite funny was that they uh, they said that the service would be better because there's more FSA offices than there is insurance agencies, and uh, I can count them in my county, and we have one. And uh, I don't know where they came up with their numbers; but they're very different from the ones I did. What do you think, Bruce, about the well, FSA? Well, you know, FSA, um, we think that the public-private partnership right now is working fine. Uh, that was an employee association, a private organization, and uh, let me tell you, we can't tell them what to do, and they can't tell us what to do. And everybody's free to put their proposals out there. So, but we actually did have a a turn at crop insurance uh, when the 1996 farm bill passed, uh, and a risk management agency was created. Uh, FSA did sell catastrophic policies for a year or two, and it didn't work very well, and didn't fit in with our agency, uh, and it wouldn't fit any better today, so we're just fine with the way things are now. Um, there's been allegations that some farmers abuse the federal crop insurance program, that they might um, you know, buy up as maximum coverage as they can, and then not farm very well, not you know, put on proper inputs and then insurance coverage. So, Brian, what do you think about that? Number one, is it going on? Number two, should it be addressed in the farm? Well, I don't care what government program is. Real food stamps to, to uh, crop insurance. You can cherry pick a person, a place, where someone's taking advantage of the program. The, the thing is, you know, how crop insurance work is, you have to have your annual production, your average production history. So, so as you claim crop insurance and your production history is lower by getting your payment, well, that just keeps eroding that APH. So realistically, if you continually do that over and over again, you're gonna get paid less and less and less. So, so it, it's not beneficial to, to that farm to do that typically. There's also an automatic trigger that if you, it has been previous, if you have 100, over 100,000 payment, which you're automatically audited, you have to go back three years, bring all your, receipts, prove your yield production, and and uh, so the automatic trigger, that and your APH erosion, you could cherry pick some people that are probably taking advantage, but it's few and far between. I think crop insurance has been around long enough now that they've actually, they, they've vetted out those problems and, and figured out those loopholes, and, and it, it's not really going on. I, I think crop insurance is very solid. Army has, has done a great job implementing this program. And, and changing it as we needed rules to, to try to try to stop these abuses. And there's oversight. You know, anytime, anytime there is any kind of a allegation of abuse, um, we get involved in them. Bruce, yeah. Bruce's office gets involved with them. I mean, it depends on you know who your um, you know who your advocate is, but I mean, we hear about it. So I think that it's addressed. Um, fairly quickly. Actually, you know, the risk to reward what they get paid to what the possible penalty is, they're insane to try to take advantage of the system because if, if you want a negative economic impact, you try to try to do something negative to the crop insurance system. It, it's just, it doesn't happen very often. 
Well, not only that, they're watching you forever after that. <laughs> yeah. There's actually automatic trigger flags of, mm -hmm. of other things, like if you have a small claim under 100,000 for consecutive years, so they, that's not a trigger and they come up. Yeah. And you have an audit also. And they are very much fun because if anybody's been around a farmer, <laughs> you can remember what last year's crop did, but you try to remember three years ago and then get all the paperwork out and explain how it all worked out. Yeah, it's, it's not a lot of fun, so most people don't want to have an audit. <laughs> Okay, before I ask for kind of closing comments, any questions on uh, the crop insurance, uh, the MPCI, or the CRP programs? So I understand that um, conservation compliance, swamp buster, sub buster aren't tied to insurance right now. Right. Um, is there a question of it being tied back in in the 2012 bill? <sighs> Good luck. There has, there has been some a commodity group, I should say, saying that they would support a program such as that. We wouldn't support anything like that. I mean, realistically, our number one asset is our land. Why would we? Why would we have a conservation issue? The problem with that is, you're you're trying to have oversight on something that, that obviously most farmers are very very conscientious of taking care of it, it, it's not a good idea we're, we're absolutely against it uh, and i i don't think it's getting any traction in to be honest with you so we're, we're not super concerned about it it's something we are watching you know, on our radar so but but aren't aren't those conservation compliance requirements tied to direct payments and other come on and yeah, and other payments? Right direct payments yeah direct payments are tied to conservation uh it, it's actually you have to have so much crop residue on, on your ground, and uh, they actually will come out, FSA will come out and measure that periodically. And if you don't have enough, then you, the first time I believe the warning group probably can speak about this, and then the second time you actually will be penalized. I just have a general question about the farm bill as far as what would you guys say to somebody? Um, who just says, well, this is just another subsidy and it needs cut. I mean, you know, what would your defense be as far as the, your best reasons for why it should stay to somebody who's not a rural person? As to why the farm bill should... Why, 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 why it's important? Should be continued? You're talking the commodity title, title one. Yeah. Yeah. Our argument always would be that, that we are one of the least subsidized nations in the world as far as farm subsidies go. And, and we would probably support it if we had a unilateral, uh, everybody went to ground zero on subsidies, every other nation. Because the problem is, is, is when they're subsidizing in Europe, we're competing against them, being all the other, Australia, Canada, you name it. And, and we're already at a disadvantage to most of their subsidies. So realistically, when we had that economic downturn, an economic downturn because our subsidies were reduced. They're still competing on a higher level than we are. So to, to keep world trade in a, that's why the World Trade Organization used these things because we need to keep a level playing field for every nation. So it's it's critical that, that we're on a level playing field with, with our competitors around the world. Well, and I've talked about, uh, you know, the historical perspective on this. Uh, we do enjoy, as I said, you know, the safest, most affordable, most abundant food supply in the world. Um, and do we want to jeopardize that? Uh, we have food security in America. Uh, we don't have, we have food independence. We don't have energy independence. We've seen what happens to our country as we don't have energy independence. We really want to try that with food because that's what we're talking about here, is gambling our food security. We don't want to go there. Uh, now there's debate over the details. There's debate around the margins of the programs. I think it's become evident, you know, as Brian and I have talked, a little different approach to things, but there's fundamental agreement on the need for safety net. It's been bipartisan in this country uh, for a long time. Um, and again, I, I don't think the country really wants uh, to jeopardize that. Yeah, to comment a little further on that, I think we've seen that in other countries around the world. Um, 
fuel shortage does not create upheaval in a country. Food shortage does. Egypt last was it last year, mm -hmm. I, and that's not a third world country. I mean, that's you know second world, coming to first world for a long time, and and huge riots in the street, government overthrows going on, and that's when when all those things start happening. So it is imperative that we're going to have our society continue as we expect it to. That food security be number one on the list. And uh, I think it's a great point to end on. And uh, I would just uh, refer to a book that really makes this point very well. It's called The Worst Hard Time by Tim Egan. And if you haven't read it, it really portrays Bruce's point, brings it home to us at a personal level, that there's nothing more destabilizing than something like the Dust Bowl mm -hmm. and politically destabilizing uh, and economically destabilizing. So I think it's a great point. And I'd like to introduce to the panel our meeting. <laughs> 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 great event. Uh, and I'm happy to be able to come. So just a brief concluding comment from each of you, if you have any thoughts. Uh, I want to mention one other program that wasn't talked about uh, tonight, a uh, farm loan program. When FSA was created under USDA reorganization back in 1995, the Farmers Home Administration and ASCS were put together. And the heart of FSA programs is now the Farm Loan Program that used to be administered by the Farmers Home Administration. Uh, we put out uh, about $100 million in loans uh, in Montana last year. Five billion dollars nationwide. And here's the really interesting thing about that program, unlike all of the other programs that we've talked about tonight. That program is funded on the principle of leverage. Uh, what what is spent of taxpayer dollars is what the losses will be on five billion dollars of lending. So because we have a very, very low loss ratio in the farm loan program in FSA, uh, there's only $100 million of taxpayer dollars spent to generate $5 billion of credit for the agricultural industry in the country. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty good program, pretty important program, not only for Montana, but the rest of the country. Let me just give you a website because uh, we've talked about a lot of acronyms and a lot of programs tonight. Uh, you can find fact sheets like this about all of the FSA programs on the Montana Farm Service Agency website. Jennifer Perez Cole, our public affairs specialist, has done a terrific job putting all these together. 2012 Producer Handbook. So if you want details about all of the programs we're involved in, go to that Montana FSA website. I click on 2012 Producer Handbook, and there will be. So again, thanks very much. This has been great. I guess my last point would be that uh, uh, Title I, which is the commodity title, is 0.6% uh, of the total national budget. And we're actually, egg is 7% of the GDP. So for every dollar spent on Title I, $14 comes back into our nation in return. What kind of investment is that? How many how, how many returns do we turn over for every dollar spent on ag? I think it's it's quite obvious that, that ag is a staple of our economy that that, uh, that will return us in the long term. Food security will keep our nation secure in more than just a food sense. Uh, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to come and speak to you. It's always always good to, to come and speak to a crowd of people who, uh, who need a new understanding at times and, and some sometimes non a backgrounds help us understand how to communicate that across. So it's a great opportunity for me. Thanks a lot. And I would echo what um, these two have said. The the egg industry to Montana and um, the importance of egg industry to Montana is incalcul incalculable. I mean when we take a look at all of the different components that make up the egg industry, we, we've only really scraped the surface. We really have. When we talk about how many producers you have, how many different type, types of producers, and what they see the future to be. I mean, they are, there are a lot of people very excited about egg production 
in Montana. And it's not only you know your your uh, grain, your your grain and livestock producers. It's uh, the local food movement. You've got nutritionists involved in this. You've got people excited about egg research. You've got people excited about you know different types of conservation. I mean, we have a huge industry in Montana that's affiliated with the egg industry. And so when you think about what agriculture means to the state, there's, there, it's no surprise that you have the dedication of the congressional delegation and the governor to this industry. Um, but when you think about how many hats a producer has to wear, you know, you're, it's, really, it, it's really the entire story, I mean. He's a, you know, he's a soil scientist. He's a, a, a lab researcher. He, he does, he does energy. He handles some um, biofuels. He, he handles um, crop insurance. I mean, we can go down the list, and it's all, it's all sitting on that one head. Um, and uh, all that's the all <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I think that that's something. It, it's, it's a pretty special industry. And it's it's really something to admire and something to work hard for, and I think that's why that's why the delegation and political leadership of the state do. And egg is not Montana's number one industry, and it will continue to be into the future. So, for years to come, up, we see no change in that anytime soon. You don't notice it in Missoula, maybe, but we do notice in Eastern Montana. <laughs> Say you do notice it in Missoula. <laughs> Market sometime yeah. here. Yeah. They're very. The local food movement is very active. The organic movement is very active. And I will tell you, in Billings, Montana, we are getting a new organic grocery store. So we will have two. <laughs> <laughs> is that a challenge to me? <laughs> no, we're just trying to figure it out. <laughs> well, let's join me in.